Romans chapter 3 once again, and we're looking at on Sunday nights, we're going through the Christian vocabulary, and I, I use the word Christian very loosely, uh, that kind of encompasses a whole wide range of denominations and believers, and in particular you understand what I mean tonight uh, about the vocabulary we use as Bible-believing people uh, that stick and uh, very closely to the Scriptures and the doctrines of the Scriptures. And we've been looking and going through we started out looking at justification by faith and uh, being justified, a wonderful, wonderful word used in the Bible. We looked then at redemption and how we were taken out of the slave market. We then saw lastly, thirdly there I should say, uh, that to do with regeneration and how we are literally given a new nature. Put off the old and put on the new. I sure like that. Tonight's word is the word propitiation. It's a little bit of a, a challenging word just to say it, but uh, very easy to understand. And as we see here, Romans chapter 3, let me see here. We're going to be down, uh, go down to verse 23. Romans 3, 23, you know well, but it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Now, Paul, in this wonderful portion of scriptures, in particular chapter 3, talks about all being sinners, and yet he says we have the propitiation given to us. The propitiation through faith in His blood. Now, we understand some of these technical terms, if you will, of the Christian life. We begin to see the sure foundation of what God has truly done for us. And I hope that's helped you as we've been going through this to understand what God's truly done for us. And we know that. We know what God's done for us. We've believed and we're thankful for that. But really, you go into depth of what some of these terms mean. What a challenge to remind us of all that Christ did for us and how He went through that all of that for us and justification as we looked at God's given us that right standing before him declared us not guilty we're declared righteous forever justification is possible because of that redemption that is in Christ Jesus now again in order to redeem us Christ had to come into the, to the marketplace of sin <clears throat> and pay the price to purchase us he took us off the market never to be sold again and set us free set us free then we saw the regeneration of the new birth the new birth is required, John 3. It's the act of God by which new life is imparted to the person who trusts Christ as his Savior. Regeneration means that God has given us his very nature by bringing us into his family by a spiritual birth. Now tonight we consider this word propitiation. Uh, here we gain a better understanding of how a holy and just God can and does declare a guilty sinner not guilty of the crimes he's actually committed. Now to help us understand this, we need to review our condition before salvation. And that's what I want to look at in Romans 3 here. Before salvation, we are termed or labeled different things, especially by the Apostle Paul here. The first three chapters of Romans make this very clear, and it's summed up. Now, beginning and presents it to us in chapter number 1, it's summed up in verse number 9 of chapter 3. Notice verse 9 there, it says, What then are we better than they know in no wise? For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles, they are all under sin. All. So we see here, uh, we need to understand, first of all, our condition before salvation, if you will, here. Now, in chapter 3 particularly, there are six indictments upon man. Six indictments. You that have stutter, st studied, stuttered, uh, <laughs> studied uh, numerology in the Bible, you know the, 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 that, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, that uh, the number six is what? Number of man, right? Okay. And we know that. We understand it. So there's six indictments given or stated in chapter 3. Uh, notice some of these. Chapter, uh, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 10. Notice as it is written, there is, first of all, none righteous. None righteous. There's none good enough, right? Secondly, notice, none that understand. Two. Three, none that seek God. Uh, four, all are gone out of the way. All are unprofitable. 
5 and 6, none do good. These are things that are given to us in these indictments. You go into the court of law and there are indictments or an indictment brought against you. I saw Tim at Circle K and I saw the, the closed circuit TV caught him taking four Snickers bars and putting them in his pocket and leaving the store without paying for them. I could do that. I do like Snickers. And you think about it. There's an indictment. We have some indictments against you. And I could say, no, no, that wasn't me. There's a guy that looked like me. You know, drove, drove the same car, was wearing the same exact tie on that night. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. There's indictment. There's an indictment to man. Six of these stated. Now, the evidence is presented in verse 13, if you will. Notice uh, he puts here, um, no, 13. Yeah, it is 13. Notice 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction or misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have uh, they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Notice that. That's the evidence. He's saying, I've told you none are righteous. Now let me tell you what these sinful people and sinful men, what they do. This is the evidence summed up. Again, we're talking, and in, in, I love the terminology Paul uses, especially in a judicial way. You go into the court. They're going to have to bring evidence against you. I saw, somebody would say, I saw Tim take that. I saw him. Now the opposing playing team is going to the defense, the going to come back and say, no, 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 no. You didn't see him. We actually have evidence. We actually have a fingerprint on those snicker bars of somebody else. There's the evidence. Now we think about the evidence is given for our sinfulness our condition before salvation, it's summed up for us here. The case is presented to us in chapter 1. The six indictments are brought to us in verses 10 through 12 of chapter 3. And then we see the evidence presented in verses 13 to 18. And then notice this, though. The verdict is read. The verdict is read. Notice verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Notice, there's the verdict. It's given. And he, the hammer comes down. You're guilty. You're guilty. You're guilty. You now pay a penalty. You are sentenced now to 300 days in jail or whatever the case is for this individual. And as we think about this, we are under that. We have been indicted, the evidence been presented, and the verdict is read. We're guilty tonight. Doesn't matter the age, you're guilty. You're guilty of sin. Now we know that Our children are coming. Most of them have come up. We have several that are not quite there to the age of accountability. But most of them are. And uh, Lord willing, we're praying for them. And Asking God to do His work in their lives. But we are sinners, aren't we? We're born sinners. We're born sinners. And that comes back to our regeneration. We're given a new nature. Now, as we think about this, uh, you and I stand before God, the righteous judge, and learn that we're guilty of disobeying God's law. We're found guilty in the highest court, and there is no appeal. No appeal. We're condemned. We face the wrath of God. How can we get out of this terrible plight and this terrible verdict? We're helpless. We can't do it ourselves. The judge loves us and desires to help us, but he is holy and just and must obey the law. The only solution is a substitute. Someone who can come in, obey the law, fulfill its righteous demands, and ultimately set us free. And that person you know is Jesus Christ. This is what propitiation is all about. He's a satisfactory payment. That's what the word means. We're going to look at it just here briefly. Satisfied payment. We have, the, the payment's been satisfied. Um, I think about some of these things and uh, so many cases across the country and the world that have gone so horribly wrong. Many people have been in, indicted and convicted of a crime they didn't do, right? We've seen those shows all the time. We watched one a while back of a fella, he served like 25 years and coming to find out he wasn't the one that did it. He didn't shoot those people. And those things, and terrible things happen. We have, in a lot of ways, a broken judicial system, but I am so thankful for our, the law of the land that we live in, obviously. But our spiritual 
system, if you will. The judicial system of the Word of God with God is not broken. And He's set us free. He's the propitiation through faith in His blood. Now, a couple things here. Let's jump into this, the definition. The definition of the term, three different forms of the same Greek word are used here. Paul uses helosterion, John uses helosmos, and both are translated propitiation. Propitiation. And so we see here, it's a satisfied payment. It's appeasing, I looked it up in, in the secular dictionary, it's appeasing the judgment and wrath of a God. And it put their lowercase g-o-d, God. You do something to appease the wrath of that God. As you know, you studied any other religions, you know the Hindus have something like, I couldn't recall what it was, umpteen million gods. Uh, you know that. They come before these, these gods, they have these shrines, and they put up and they worship and they bow down before it, trying to appease the wrath of that god. And they believe that if you have a crippled or a mentally uh, challenged child or something of a deformity, they believe that the gods are not pleased with you. And the horrific things that they'll do you know, to those children and other things. The, this is the, the normal uh, thing of a man trying to come up with his own way to appease a god. And again, it's a testimony to the reality of God, that in human nature, man wants to appease some kind of God. They feel guilty before God, don't they? They're guilty. They're guilty. I know before I was saved, I know that. I had a guilt inside about sin and about my sinful behavior. I didn't know what it was. I thought I just felt bad about it. Paul reveals to us that's conscience, and that is a defiling of that, and that's a, a inside of us, and Wonderfully, as we get to know the Lord, we realize He's always been working on me and trying to help us. There's a definition of it. Uh, now, later Luke would use this word and translated it as merciful, Luke 18, 13. And it says, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, and he smote his breast. What did he say? God be merciful to me, a sinner. <clears throat> this is the word used there, merciful. That payment, if you will. That satisfied, appeasing of a God. Uh, this one is also found in Hebrews where it's translated to make reconciliation. Or mercy seat is also used. Hebrews 2.17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful high priest, faithful high priest, and things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And then later again in Hebrews 9.5, as we think about this appeasing of a God. And tonight we're going to see that. Now, first of all, it's not appeasing God's anger or turning His wrath into love. <clears throat> and I say that because many people out there believe that. It's turning God's wrath into love. It's, it's transforming it. That's what it is. It's not that at all. Because He is a God of judgment. It is satisfying God's holiness and His justice. It's not that God says, well, I'll put aside my wrath and judgment and uh, I'll let you go free. No, it's appeasing that. Jesus Christ comes into the courtroom and he what? Stands in our place and says, I'll take Tim's place. Yeah, but he's got a hard sentence ahead of him. I'll take it. <clears throat> I'll take it. Are you worthy to take it? Absolutely, he says. Now, we think about it. God is a God of judgment and God is a consuming fire. We must not forget that. Uh, a lot of churches today, and I appreciate a lot of those pastors, but they preach a lot about the love of God. There's nothing wrong with that. We, we love to hear that. The love of God. The love of God in our lives. Love of God. God loves you. God wants to bless you. God wants to all of that. But we also forget, I think, a lot of times, God is a consuming fire. And God is not happy. And God will, by the way, God will do and allow bad things into your life and problems into your life when you do sinful things and you don't obey the Bible. Trust me, I know. <laughs> he will, oh, that was just happen chance. That was just a coinky dink that I ran into the back of that semi truck. No, it's not. God is working in your life. He's not pleased with your sinful behavior. Now, again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but we must be cautious and careful that we do not overstep this and misunderstand that God is not pleased with disobedient children. You know He will bring conviction into your life. If you disregard conviction, He'll bring chastening into your life. If you disregard chastening of, of the Holy Spirit in your life, He will take you home. He will take you out of this world. And now we think about, He is a God of judgment. Again, it's the satisfying of God's holiness. It's the satisfying of God's justice. He says, okay, I'll take that. That will satisfy that. 
that will pay the price. Now, propitiation. It satisfies the holiness of God so that he is able to extend grace and mercy to the lost sinners. And that's what we need. We need it. We're lost, as he said earlier. None are good. No, not one. Now he's reiterating, as you know, Psalm 14 in particular. None are good. None are righteous. Nothing can take that place except Jesus Christ. The man that had no sin, the only one that could. Now God is holy and must punish sin. We know that. He cannot break His law. God is love. He desires to save us and take us to heaven. We know that. God is consistent and all His attributes balance out. Again, He won't overstep one attribute for the other. You know, they balance. His holiness demands punishment of sin, therefore. His love moves Him to save us. This is where Jesus Christ and the word propitiation come in. Jesus Christ satisfied the righteous demands of the law. Perfection and death for imperfection. He lived a perfect life as a man. We know that. Peter says he was sinless. He died for man who failed to meet the first demand of the law. Romans 3.23, as we just read. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. I've used that many, many, many times, sharing the gospel with an individual. And I'll use that term and I'll say you can try your very best to climb up to God in your righteousness, but you still come very short, right? You come short of it. And uh, you think about it. You climb up. You do your best. You try and do good deeds. You try and clean yourself up, but only to fall again. That's the world. Again, we talked about reformation. The world tries to reform us, and it doesn't work. We need transformation, and God transforms us. He died for us. His holiness, the holiness of God has been satisfied. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 8 real quick and notice this because what he says in Romans 8 verse 1. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation <clears throat> to them which are in, notice that, you might want to underline that, in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation. No more of it. There's no condemnation on them who are in Christ Jesus. Now Paul later will say, any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Talking about regeneration. He's in. You're in. You're in the family. So we understand and see here what he's saying. That, that, that punishment of sin, the holy demand of punishment for sin, the propitiation has satisfied that. So a little bit of a definition. Let me say a couple things here. Number two, the Old Testament demonstration of this. The Old Testament demonstration. This is a, we're going to see here in a minute, Leviticus chapter 16, instructions given for the annual day of atonement. Now some people still keep the annual day of atonement. I don't believe it's necessary, but we were talking to a couple guys on the job site, still hold to that. And uh, uh, very interesting anyways, but the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies only on this day. He sprinkled the blood of the animal sacrifices on the mercy seat, which was the cover, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. So we see here, first of all, the priest offered first for himself. That's in Leviticus 16.3. The priest then offered for the people. As you know, he selected two goats. He offered one goat for sin. This is all in Leviticus, chapter 16 in particular. He selected the two. He offered one for a sin. He made the other one a scapegoat, didn't he? We use that term today as well. You're a scapegoat, you know. And you understand he would let that, get, that goat go. One described it in this manner, the right signifying the life of the people, the loss of which they had merited by their sins, was offered to God in the blood as the life of the victim, and that God, by this ceremony, was appeased, and their sins expiated. Hence the lid of expiation, the mercy seat, was sprinkled on the mercy seat. It satisfied, it satisfied a holy and righteous God. This is the Old Testament demonstration of this very thing. And you ought to read the Bible book for book. You ought to read Leviticus and Hebrews. You ought to read some of these things in unison, if you will, or together, because it will greatly help you understand the Bible and encourage you with it. But God comes in the New Testament and He abolishes this law and gives us through the blood of Jesus Christ the propitiation. Not only that, but God was teaching Israel what Christ would do. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 real quick. Hebrews 9 and notice what Christ did do, but it's explained to us here very clearly. Hebrews 9. 
Hebrews 9, verse 8, <clears throat> the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, notice verse 11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once, underline that once, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats... And the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testimony, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's a lot, of, lot to say there. Do you understand? He's talking about the example given, and Jesus, you know the book of Hebrews is Jesus, Jesus is greater. Everything, the law, Jesus is greater. Sacrifices, Jesus is greater. Everything about it. Now, the, the, the demonstration given to us, God is teaching Israel that Christ, what Christ would do and did do. He shed his own blood to atone for our sins. Two, he took all our sin upon himself. That's what the goat did. He sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. He truly accomplished what God asked him to do. The Father did. And you know Jesus said, I, always do, I do always those things that please the Father. I fulfilled everything that the Father gave me to do. And you know that. God was teaching Israel what to do. As the Lord Jesus died on the cross, we know, his blood turned the throne of judgment into a throne, throne of grace, a mercy seat. God's justice has been satisfied. Now God can forgive our sins. And take them from us as far as east is from the west, as the psalmist puts it. The law has been satisfied. God is free to extend pardon and mercy. He can be just as he forgives sins. Again, we come back to this, the propitiation. So there's an Old Testament demonstration. Let me say thirdly here, lastly, there's the blessing, the blessing of it. And this is where I want to wrap it up. Let's go to 1 John, because 1 John, you... No, clearly gives a great, great definition of this propitiation. Chapter 2, 1 John, no, excuse me, 4, I'm sorry, 1 John 4, as we see this, 1 John 4, now notice here, verse 10, herein is love, not that we loved God, but... He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and His love is perfected in us. <clears throat> so he goes on to talk about that love. But he says it's not that God, we loved God. Again, coming back to Romans 3. None are good, none are righteous, none are good enough. We come short of the glory of God. As much as we want to climb and cr crawl our way out of that horrible pit, as the psalmist puts it, what's he say? We can't do it. It's God that takes us up out of the horrible put pit and puts my feet upon the ground and puts a new song in my mouth. And he helps me and he establishes my going. See, he says that. Now he says, it's not that I love God and made myself right, cleaned myself up. He says that God loved me and then sent his son to be the propitiation for my sins, the satisfied payment, the blessing of this. That we understand that sinners can be saved. Sinners can be saved. I'll never forget that that man one time told me that he just couldn't be saved. He would sinned too much. God would never accept him. He's too sinful. And clearly saying it's not your sin that's keeping you from it. It's your unbelief. It's your unbelief. The condemnation is that light is coming into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. It's your unbelief. And you think about so many people believe they can't be saved. The Bible is clear that says that we can be saved and God loves you. And he sent the propitiation. He sent the satisfied payment for you. Could you imagine an inmate right now 
sitting on death row when they was come and knock on a cell and they said, hey, somebody's willing to pay the price. Somebody's confessed to the sin. Somebody's confessed to killing that person. You didn't do it. And that person said, nah, I like it here. <laughs> I'd rather stay here. I'd rather sit in the cell and eat the nasty food and sleep on a cot and uh, go through all the rigmarole of the jail system and the prison system and do all of that. I'd rather stay here than go home to my family. I'd rather stay here. That's what people are saying when they say no to Christ. I'd rather stay. And do you know the Bible is clear that there are people that actually, and we know that for certain living in this world, people would rather serve sin, rather stay in their sin than come to the light. They'd rather live in darkness rather than come to the light. They'd rather love for self and pleasures and pleasures and pleasing self, as we talked about this morning, than to come to the light and let God save them and accept that propitiation. What a challenging thing. Horrible, horrible decisions. But the blessing, the blessing is that sinners can be saved. There is salvation available to the whole world. There's salvation available. There's a motivation to get the message out to the lost, to us that are saved, that we understand that there is a payment. There is something that's already been done it's already been done. All we have to do. And we would run to and fro and up and down the streets and up and down our city to let people know, hey, it's already been paid for. You can go into Tractor Supply right now, get whatever you want. Somebody paid for everything. They said we can go in and get anything we want. You go to Walmart. Somebody said they paid the bill. They'll pay the bill for anything you buy in Walmart. I mean, I wouldn't go to Walmart, but <laughs> I'd hope it would be a better store than that. You think about it. This is what we say since the payment's been made. Our holy and righteous God has been satisfied. We can then tell people and say, God has paid the price and he's made a way for you, for me. Sinners can be saved. Believers can be forgiven. Believers can be forgiven. Notice chapter 2 and verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2, it says, and he is the, what? Propitiation. Chapter 2 and verse 2 of 1 John. He's the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He's a propitiation. He's a satisfied payment for our sins. Not for ours only, for the sins of the whole world. And since He is that, we can keep His commandments. Since He is that and done that, we can keep His word. And He goes on. We can be forgiven. There's, again, no need to be saved over and over again as so many teach. There's only the need to confess that sin as you know that. In chapter 1, verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the payment's been made. Payment doesn't need to be made over and over again. We find strength, uh, thirdly, for living for today. We are no longer condemned. Romans 8, verse 1, we will never be rejected. Ephesians 1, verse 6, again, thinking through this. We can find strength in living for today. Let me read you Hebrews chapter 4 by way of closing here. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, wonderful portion of Scripture. But as you know what it says, he says, verse 15, For we not have an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come. Let us therefore come boldly, boldly under the throne of grace, that we may, we may obtain mercy and Find grace to help in time of need. Not only did He die for our sins, but we come to Him, don't we? We come to Him and we ask Him. We ask Him, right? We come to Him and we ask Him to help us. We come to Him and ask Him for strength in time of need. And so you think about that tonight. The, the propitiation. Oh, what a wonderful thing to think about. He satisfied the payment. I don't know about you, but I often think about certain situations or scenarios that are not biblical and could never happen, but I think about what if? What if there was no satisfied payment? What if man was left to himself? What if after the garden incident, God said, I'm done, no longer? What if he never sent his son to die for our sins? What if we were in the dark right now, spiritually? We had no way to cleanse ourselves. We had no way to get out and crawl out of our horrible pit and hole we're in. What if our condemnation and our eternal destiny was set for a place called hell? What if? And you think about that. 
yet there's a satisfied payment in Jesus Christ. Amen? Oh, I'm so thankful for that. Do you know tonight there's millions of people just directly around us in our city, in our state, that truly believe there is no way out. There's no way out of the darkness. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. They don't know that Jesus Christ came and satisfied and appeased a holy and righteous God, do they? We ought to get that word out to them. We ought to share the gospel with them. But my friends, tonight as you think about Jesus Christ has made that payment. Boy, that lifts our burden, doesn't it? You're thinking about problems tomorrow. You're thinking about all the stresses that are going to come this week. You think about disease and pain that may come. You think about bills and other things right now. I know weighing upon our hearts. You think about doctor visits and other things that are coming you don't want to deal with. And then you think about, hey, none of that compares to the satisfactory payment, the appeasing of a righteous God. And now, because of that, my faith in Jesus Christ and what He did, I have eternal salvation. Yeah, life is going to stink sometimes. It's going to be hard. It's going to hurt. But I am so thankful and I can rejoice and lay my head on my pillow tonight in complete peace because I have accepted the satisfied payment through Jesus Christ. William Cowper, who was a writer of Christian hymns, you may have heard of him before, now it says, he says at one point in his life he was very discouraged. He was a very nervous individual. He was a very uh, depressed at times individual, and he was ready to give up. And he wrote, On a day when I was extremely distraught, I flung myself into a chair near the window, and seeing a Bible there, ventured once more to apply to it for comfort and instruction. The first verse I saw was the 25th of the 3rd of Romans whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. I saw the sufficiency of the atonement He had made, my pardon sealed in His blood, and all the fullness and completeness of His justification. In an instant I believed and received the peace of the gospel. And later He would pen the words to the famous song we often will sing, There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood, Lose all their guilty stains. That's us tonight, isn't it? All the guilty stains are gone. And the love and care and ultimate crucifixion and sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Tonight, my friends, don't forget that you have received, I pray. And if you haven't, tonight's a night to be saved. But if you received Christ as your Savior, you are in right standing with God. I pray you are. But you receive the satisfied payment. The righteous demands of a holy God have been appeased, have been met. And by the way, you didn't have to pay for it. You didn't have to do anything. You believed, and you turned to Him, and He saved you. I hope that's you tonight, and I hope that's encouraged you. Remember, God's paid the price. What a wonderful God we serve, right? Amen. All right. Well, Lord, we thank You again for tonight. Thank You for an opportunity to look in Your Word. And Father, we're so thankful to You. We're so thankful that, God, Your demands have been met. We're so thankful that, Lord, You've saved us. We didn't do anything, Lord, to deserve it, obviously. We did nothing to uh, attain to that, Father. We didn't crawl our way up out of a dark pit. We didn't make ourselves holy. We didn't clean ourselves up, Lord. You did it all. You looked down and saw me and saw my sinful nature. You saw the mess I was in. You saw there was no hope. And you said, I'll still die for him. It's not that we loved you first, Lord. It's that you loved us us and sent your son to be a propitiation, the satisfied payment for our sins. And I'm so thankful for that. Thank you for these folks that have been so faithful, Lord, once again this day. How we thank you to allow us to gather together in your house and worship you and praise you. Be with our, once again, as I say weekly, Lord, but be with our children. Please put your hand and hedge about them. Watch over them and protect them, Father, from the evils and from the adversary wanting to corrupt their minds. I pray for our mothers and grandmothers, our fathers and grandfathers. Lord, you keep them from the evil one. Strengthen them in their purity this week, Lord. And give us the strength to abide in your word and through your Holy Spirit empower us, Lord. We thank you. We love and thank you, Father. Bless us this week in Jesus' precious name. Amen.